Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello, thank you for joining me today. Um, so, who am I? Um, well, I've been in IT since 1994. Um, worked for various companies of different sizes. Um, I'm currently working for RGP Architects and have been for the past 16 years. Uh, and I've been heavily involved with cybersecurity, as you can see. Um, thing is, with small businesses, we're facing problems the same problems as the large businesses, but we don't have the budgets, we don't have the resources, um, so fighting back is a lot more difficult. But I'm here to show you that you can actually fight back at a, for a budget that's affordable. So firstly, why would cyber criminals target me or us as a small business? Well, it doesn't really matter how big or small you are, we've all got something the criminals want, we all have data, we all have bandwidth, and we all have processing power. And they use this to, com to commit extortion, fraud, theft, and reuse our assets to further commit extortion, fraud, and theft. So we all have credentials, we all have bank accounts, um, so we're constantly fished for information. Those login credentials can be used to send more fraudulent emails out, and the scale of the problem is absolutely massive. Okay, McAfee has now over 734 million known pieces of malware in their database. So even at 99.99% .99 effective blocking, that still leaves you with 73,000 pieces of malware we're not protected against. Facebook, they removed over 583 million fake profiles in just the first three months of 2018. And Twitter, over two months, suspended 70 million accounts. So it's a vicious circle. Once criminals have unauthorized use of our assets, they can then either extort us with ransomware, try and trick us into paying them fraudulently, or steal our data and use it for their own purposes. So what can we do? Well, the, the first thing we can do effectively is just to reduce our exposure. The less we have to be attacked, the less of a problem. Um, one of the easiest ways is immediately set up a Wi-Fi network for all your staff that's not connected to the main network. Get them to do as much as possible on their own devices on, on a network that's not part of your business network. That immediately reduces your exposure. And then things like Windows XP, Windows Vista, they're not supported, they're full of bugs. If you still have them, you need to get rid of them. Also, if every machine you have has Java or Silverlight, ask yourself, do you actually need it? You know, Java is always, it's been full of holes, Adobe Flash, full of holes and security vulnerabilities. It needs to be turned off except when required. Same with Silverlight. There's no point having all this installed just as a default setting if there's no need for it. Also, you can, as a small business, make things someone else's problem. You can move your email from Exchange to Office 365 or Google. You can use cloud services like Microsoft Azure, put your license in with Adobe and be part of Creative Cloud that you don't have to worry, even remote access with Log Me In. There's things you can do that makes it someone else's problem. So you haven't got any front facing services. It's not your under your control and therefore the security of it isn't your problem. All you have to worry about is your passwords. Old computers is another issue. Make sure you've got rid of them because anything over eight years old um, is just no longer updated and gives you potential hardware problems. And then when you do plug them in, there's you know, possibly years of updates, uh, which should slow someone down and they'll probably just say skip and start using it and could leave you exposed. Oops, sorry, I just accidentally clicked. Um, 
Okay, hopefully you're back now. Um, the, the temptation to use illegal software, especially with very expensive drawing software, has always been there. So, you know, when you're asked to pay £5,000 for one license, the temptation to use a crack utility has been there. But these key generators nearly always contain a virus in one shape or form. And there's no point, you know, stealing and having illegal copies of Photoshop because now it costs £10, um, £10 a month to be on the photography plan. It's just not worth the risks. The same with your old routers. Um, they're a security risk. Even the ones that come with service providers have been known to have issues. So, you know, if your route is three years old, you know, seriously have a look at changing it and upgrading, um, you know, just from a security standpoint. And also we need to look at just how much information we're giving away on social media that aids the criminals. Um, if we're handing over details about where we've been, what we're doing, and they can use that for targeted phishing attacks, targeted SEO fraud, because they'll have snippets of information that kind of legitimizes their emails, and we're giving it all away. So what do you do when you've got no budget to speak of, which is a typical problem for most small businesses? Well, it's not just about the technology. There's three sides that have to be covered. There's the technology, the people, and the processes. There's no point you can have the best systems in the world, but if the people don't understand how to use them and what to do and what not to do, it doesn't make any difference. That's what happened with Target when they were hacked. They actually had the technology in place, except no one was looking at the alerts. Same with the processes. If people don't know what to do, you haven't given the right settings and the guidelines and the instructions aren't in place, once again, the technology will let you down. You can have the people who know what to do, but if the automated processes or the settings aren't right, it just won't work. There's also a lot of training you can do with regards to people that doesn't cost anything. ESET, the antivirus firm, is offering free cyber training. You, you, know, you just sign up. Um, you say you, you use their software. They don't seem to check, um, and you can go. Also, the London Digital Security Centre has information, Take 5, and I recently signed up with Hitchcock Cyber Insurance for the, purely um, for their Cyber Clear Academy. The fact that I got a quarter of a million pounds worth of cyber insurance was academic because the premium um, was a fraction of the cost of the training resources that they give you. So you can stretch your money further so let's go to the main crux of this, which is the seven areas every small business needs to cover. Uh, antivirus, patch management, email filtering, web filtering, admin privileges, and access control. And lastly, but most importantly, if all things go wrong, it's your backups. That's what kind of saves the day. Now, it doesn't matter how good you are in any one of these areas if you leave gaps. There's no point in having the best antivirus and patch management if um, there's nothing controlling the access or admin privileges, you've got bad passwords, and people just get fished. You know, the antivirus won't help you there. Same if you don't filter all your emails and people are just flooded with their mailboxes full of endless malicious emails and phishing emails, you know, and they can't find the legitimate ones for the the bad ones, you, know, you need everything to be covered. And I'm trying to show you that you can do it for no more than a cup of a premium coffee a week per person. Because when you're choosing the security solutions, you need to make sure you're not blowing your entire budget on a Ferrari, when actually you need a whole range of things to address your needs. So, you know, spend the budget wisely and it goes a lot further than you think. So area number one, yeah, antivirus. Well, you know, why do we need antivirus if it's built into Windows? You know, and the top quote is actually from Microsoft. If you're running Windows 10, 
Windows 8.1 or Windows 8, you've already got Windows Defender built in, helping to protect you. So why are there hundreds of firms selling antivirus? Why is every InfoSec convention full of hundreds of vendors? Something must not be right. So yes, while Windows does come with basic antivirus, it's just that, basic. You know, if you've got no choice but, and that's all you've got, fine. But, you know, it's definitely worth paying for some premium antivirus. And then when you choose an antivirus solution, these are a list of all the things that you can help choose and distinguish what you want. You know, so there's price, there's performance. There's the manageability, reputation, customer support, whether it's cloud-based, that's my personal preference, whether it blocks zero-day threats, whether it supports all the operating systems you want, whether it includes application whitelisting, anti-ransomware, whether the firewall has advanced features. A big one that's touted a lot is the use of AI and machine learning, which depending on what you want, it can be a bit of a red herring because a lot of the major antivirus companies have some degree of machine learning and AI in their products now. There's network intrusion detection, root cause analysis, built-in VPN functioning, sandboxing, whether it's won awards, and whether there's any form of ID theft protection. Think of it as a shopping list. Work out what's important to you, and then go away and do your research, and there's websites that will help you help narrow down your choice. And then at that point, you switch over and you do a 30-day trial and you see if it works, you see if you can manage it. There's no point having something that's winning awards and everyone tells you it's great if you can't seem to configure it right. This is my particular antivirus that I have currently. It's, it's F-Secure's platform, it's, it's a cloud-based system. And the main thing you get over with business antivirus is the dashboard that tells you any given point how many of your machines are protected and what state they're in. And with F-Secure, the one I have also includes patch management. So, you know, the protection state, it seems a bit low in the software updates, but that's Microsoft, you know, their patch Tuesday. Um, and there's a few machines that were turned off, which is why I ended up with such low scores. There's also things you can put in for free. Um, I'm a firm believer in secondary anti-ransomware software because I, I like to wear as many bulletproof vests as I can, because as long as something stops the nasties, you're good. Ransom Free by Cyber Reason is one of those free products. It does exactly what it says, alerts you if any suspicious files are being encrypted. So if you haven't got anti-ransomware as one of the premium features, you can install a freebie from one of the big security firms. It's also important as part of your protection to protect yourself with a VPN, especially if you have a lot of people out on the road. Um, I use F-Secure Freedom. It works on Windows. It works on mobiles. It works on practically anything. So if anyone ever has to use a Wi-Fi hotspot, um, they've got freedom to protect them. Uh, it filters the traffic as well, so it makes a big difference. Wi-Fi can be easily... Um, created that looks like a genuine one um, by criminals, especially in hotel foyers, airports. Um, and then once you're connected to them, everything you do, they can see, uh, including all your logins and that. So for the sake of uh, a nominal fee a year for multiple users, uh, you can get a decent VPN to protect you. The second area is patch management. You know, well, why do we need patch management when, you know, Windows updates itself anyway? Yes, it does, but all the other software around it may not. And we have a lot of software. It's amazing just what we collect over the years as businesses. Um, and some of them have flaws. Adobe is a big one. There's always things going on with Adobe Reader. Um, also, things like Notepad++, media players they all tend to have security issues. And a patch management system gives you that overview and will push out the updates. And they also tell you what software you have. So if anyone has software you didn't recognize, the patch management system will normally pick it up 
and you know, it will tell you what you've got. So it doubles up as a, as a software audit. It's also important to make sure you're on the correct version of Windows because believe it or not, Windows 10 is already out of service for particular versions. The release version, in fact, four versions are now out uh, end of life. You know, the last one just a few days ago, version 1703, which came out April 2017. We've got a big headache coming up at the end of next year because Windows 7 uh, will go to end of support. So January 14th, 2020, straight after Christmas, two weeks after, um, we'll find that none of our Windows 7 machines have support on them anymore. Also, the recent 2nd of October update is now back. It was just pulled due to problems. You know, and that will only even last, you know, less than two years. So it's like a year and a half. So we, whatever happens, we're kind of forced if we're in the Windows world to stay on the last three versions. It's not just uh, desktops and laptops, mobile phones need updates too. These are all the updates that came out for iOS. Um, for iOS 10, there was 11. For iOS 11, there was 14, and you know we've already had uh, two updates or one update, sorry, for um, iOS 12, which came out a few days ago. So when it comes to patch finding, you have to look at everything you have, not just your desktop and laptops. Uh, you can use another free tool here. It's, it's called Thicotics uh, Free Endpoint Application Discovery Tool. Um, you don't need a credit card or anything, and it reports all the vulnerable applications. So if, if you're not sure if you need a decent patch management solution uh, and you think you're covered, run this and just see what it finds. If it doesn't find anything, then you're good. If it does, then consider uh, looking at the options of what you can do. Next, we move on to email filtering. This is where most of the nasties come in. So what are the types of emails? Well, there's only two types. They're either genuine or they're bogus. So the bogus ones can be spoofed. The, the display name can be swapped over. So it says one thing of a company, but it's actually coming from somewhere else. Uh, there's lookalike domains where they've changed certain characters. To, so when you quickly glance at it, it looks like it's come from somewhere. But then on the genuine side, there's either a genuine email or one that's been compromised. And that's where a lot of criminals are focusing now to get our credentials because the compromised emails normally will get through all the spam filters because we deal with them on a daily basis. And then it then falls into the bogus category where the criminals are then trying to disrupt us, get our credentials, extort us, commit fraud or theft. And they can do that either with a malicious attachment, a malicious URL, or an attachment with a malicious URL. So there's some practical things we can do immediately. We can block file types that we would never need to use as a business unless we were web developers or programmers. All of these file types listed you know, are, can run a program or run scripts that can then run a program. And there's no reason to allow them in your email system. The same with macro enabled office files. It's worth automatically quarantining them and then you can review, review them. Um, office should block macros and warn you straight away, but it's still a tried and tested way for cyber criminals to infect us. And if you happen to use things like Office 365, yeah, it's, this is all built in. You can then turn on the common attachments filter um, under the settings, under anti-malware, and then you can add as many entries as you want. Also, it's important to make sure we block executable programs inside attachments, inside zip attachments, because an email can come in and it can contain 
anything. It can even contain another email. It can contain a zip file that contains another email that contains a PDF that contains a link that takes you somewhere malicious. They can nest things. But the worst thing, you need to make sure you, you can't run a program. And once again, for Office 365 users, this is available straight away, but it's not turned on as default for a lot of places. So it's worth, you know, blocking it where any attachment has ex executable content. So to prove that emails are still the main infection route, this is my September report from my email filter, which is a company called Fusemail. Now we only have like 35 people, um, about 50 endpoints. And yet we still had in excess of 7,000 emails in September that were rejected or blocked. 50 were flagged as viruses and I created a policy that would block emails by file size and they had a URL shortener like Bitly. So if it was absolutely tiny with a shortened URL, so no email signature, it would immediately be blocked. And that's catching um, on average about 150 to 200 emails a month. The best thing about filtering your emails is you're not downloading all of this. You're stopping it before it gets to you. So that saves you on bandwidth. Um, it's not being processed at your end. So it makes sense. The things you can do like enable DMARC to stop yourself being spoofed. Um, and there's a great web service called on DMARC. It's actually free for very small businesses. Even then it's, it starts, I think $12 a month and it helps you set up and conv configure DMARC, um, which will make your domain, um, it will stop it being spoofed and give you an additional layer of security. The actual setting up of DMARC doesn't really cost anything. It's actually the aggro of doing it and getting it right. The first stage you only in reporting, so nothing happens if, if it's not configured right, you, you just get the reports. And then you can turn on two additional steps to block and quarantine. Um, and more and more businesses are turning DMARC on as a form of protection. Next, from our email, a lot of our emails go out to the web and that's where we have to filter. I filter um, everything via the cloud. So I'm moving from one vendor to Siren and these companies like Zscaler and Siren, they have um, test systems on their website to see just how well you are protected. You take it with a pinch of salt, but you know, if you fail on absolutely everything, then there's a good chance you're not really as protected as you think. Once again, filtering all your traffic before it gets to you makes sense, it stops bits of web pages loading, but you're none the wiser. So a malicious advert, you don't see it. And because they're seeing all your traffic, they're also seeing when your computers try to talk to a botnet or anything else. So my previous vendor, Zscaler, in a typical month, it would stop 5,000 harmful activities on average, 250 security threats. My firewall would block a whole load more. Remember, this is for 35 people. And those elements could be in various web pages. Uh, but the thing is the users aren't aware of what's being blocked. You can also filter your DNS. It doesn't cost anything to use Quad9. And like the name says, you just change all your DNS to 9.9.9.9 and away you go. It's licensed for business use, it works on mobiles, it works on tablets, it works on practically anything. And it gives you a whole load of protection. Um, some major companies are behind it. Um, they've got over 18 different threat providers of intelligence. Um, it's fast, it works, and it's free. Admin privileges. Now, if you're a Windows user, what the criminals want is they're trying to get you, trying to get to your machines with admin privileges. From here, they can change passwords, add users, do pretty much what they want. 
So it's important and it doesn't cost anything to actually make sure all your users are running as a standard users where they can't install software, they can't do absolutely anything and everything to their machine, um, or even if they have network admin access as well. There's software that can help this, but you don't have to resort to that. You can just simply create a second account on everyone's machine that has the admin access with a different password and make them run as a standard mm. user for everything else. I use a system by CyberArk which controls that management so when something does need admin rights it pops up and they can just click OK or deny. It also includes application whitelisting um, and between our 30 odd users or 50 machines we somehow managed to find 30,000 different programs. So application whitelisting basically says if it's not on the list, it can't run. It can be a bit of a pain to set up initially, which is why you start off in a reporting mode. But if the if something malicious can't run because it's not on the list, you're protected. It's pretty basic the way it functions, um, but you're glad you've got it. When some access control. The biggest form of access control we have is our passwords. And if you don't know about the worst passwords list by Teams ID, go over to their website and have a look. Um, there's over a hundred and they collate them every year from breach results, databases that are dumped on the internet from various hacks. If any of your users' passwords are on this list, you need to get them to change them because these are used by automated credential stuffing bots. They will try every one of these passwords in seconds against email addresses and known services, different web services, they just keep trying. So reusing your passwords is a big problem and especially if you reuse your passwords with one of the worst known passwords. So how do you remember your passwords? You know, are we writing them down on post-it notes? In journals, are they on your phone, or are you using a password manager like Dashlane or LastPass or One Login or Ping? There's even things like YubiKeys, where you know it's a two-factor, so they can't. The password's not enough, or the password's remembered on the key. Asking everyone to change their password every 30 days and have unique passwords is realistically a tall order. People will write them down. So make sure they have at least strong passwords and write them down in a way that's not immediately obvious. It can just be bad handwriting and they can add a few extra characters on the end that don't mean anything, that aren't really part of the password, but to prying eyes, they wouldn't know that. So like two-factor authentication is pretty much the way to go because passwords on their own aren't enough. If I have an email address and a password, that's all I need. So with two-factor, basically you also need typically their phone as well. So to log into any of these online services, you'll also need the code that gets sent to the phone, whether as a text message or via an app. Now you can play around with this for free. If you have Office 365, the admin accounts, you can turn it on for free. PayPal offers it for free. Amazon offers it for free. So you can't buy anything without sending them this extra code. Now, you can also check if your emails have been part of a hack for free at haveibeenporn.com. Yeah, you can even sign up so that it will notify you, so you don't have to keep checking it. Just visit them once, enter all your staff into the notify me field, and then if you get an email, you know, their username, their, that email address has been found in a database as part of a breach. And then you can then make changes to the passwords on those accounts. If they've got two-factor, you don't have to worry quite so much, but it's worth having this knowledge and it doesn't cost anything. Area seven, backups. Now we can spend 
as little or as much as we want on backups, but at the end of the day, it's the best remedy for ransomware. Machines also die. The, you can lose data on any machine at any point for a whole variety of reasons. So there's the rule of three. You need to make sure your backups are in three places because there's no point having your backup on a USB drive connected to the server. If there's a fire, you'll lose it all. Likewise, there's no point just having it in the same room. If there's another fire, you could still lose it all or if it's stolen. So it's best to have something local, something in another location and something in the cloud. Now, depending on what you want, you can use something like a cloud backup service, a backup server, a network drive, a portable drive, or memory sticks, or a whole mixture, depending on what you want, whether it's your daily backups, whether you're storing long-term archive data, or full system snapshots to recover if there's a problem. Yeah, I use a mixture of cloud services, network drives, and portable drives. The portable drives I like are Western Digital because the encryption software is built in, uh, it, it's easy to use, um, and then by staying on that model and that make, it, it, we don't have to worry about the software. The encryption software is on the right machines, and I, I ship one to my Manchester office, and the Manchester office ship ones to me. We do that quarterly. We have daily cloud backups, weekly local backups to NAS drives, and there's also in the Manchester a dedicated backup server as well. So it's important to get your backup strategy right because when all else fails, that's what you rely to keep the business going. Now, if something does happen, you've got to deal with the security incident. And what a lot of people don't spend any time on is working out what to do. You know, posters and guides that help people, having alternative ways of communicating. If everyone's credentials on their email has been compromised, you can't really use it. So it's worth looking at things like Slack or Riva. You can actually get everyone on Slack. I don't know if you still can, but it used to be free for internal use. There's also frameworks that can help you. The NISTGov cyber framework, where it's breaks it down to five stages of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And then you can put in your processes, you know, whether it's you know, who to call at the right time. But so it's worth going through the scenarios and exercise of what you need to recover. Now, this can be a, a USB stick with malware bytes on it or things like Rkill. Um, for me, you know, I'm, a serious incident, I'll be calling my cyber insurance provider, Hiscox. There's also websites like nomoransom.org that help um, recover from a ransom attack. And there's even online processes to help with security incidents. Process.st has a free checklist. Um, it's worth looking at and going through and make your own version. Run through scenarios because you know, eventually one we will get caught out. So having that USB stick with the software you need so you're good to go, have people understand what they need to do, that they need to unplug machines from the network, not turn them off. You know, work out with a flow chart or diagrams or posters for your staff. And then what does this all cost? Well, it doesn't actually cost anywhere near as much as most people think if you choose wisely. The antivirus and patch management for me works out about 30 pounds a year per person. The email filtering complete with a 10 year archive comes in at 33 pounds per person per year. The web filtering slightly more. The admin privilege software and the access control with two factor adds up to about 150 pounds a year per person. £12.50 a month, or just under £3 a week, which in London is the price of a latte. So you need to ask yourself, is it worth the risks? Can I afford a latte per person to protect them?
there's different vendors, different suppliers that will advise you, but so long as you make sure all the bases are covered, you will reduce your risks and also have things in place for when things go wrong. Chances are, if the bases are covered, they won't go wrong too far. Because even though something punches through, if you've got admin privilege control and access control, yeah, they may only just make it through the door, but no further. So my cyber defenses come in a bit more. I've got a few more than most. Um, I filter my emails twice, once via Fusemail, and then again with advanced threat protection. And I also have additional custom exchange rules in Office. Every incoming and outgoing email goes to a compliance archive. I also have a third party um, product for reporting on Office 365. My emails are filtered, desktop antivirus. There's also dedicated anti-ransomware via Sophos with Intercept X and yet another dedicated anti-ransomware with, with Crypto Prevent. My servers are on a managed antivirus um, Sentinel One, which actually offered a thousand dollar ransomware um, payback if some if they were infected. Quad Nine is free. My firewalls are Cisco Meraki. CyberArk was the management application management and privilege management, and we've got two-step, two-factor logins. You know, my business, we're architects, we work for pension companies and finance houses, so we have to punch above our weight. But even then, it doesn't have to cost an absolute fortune. Um, as you sat through this with me, uh, you can download some of my stuff here. Um, the website's underneath, uh, and there's a discount code. So I'll give you a few seconds if you want to write that down. I think you're going to get a copy of the presentation anyway. And now I'll hand you back. Thank you, Nick, for this very insightful presentation. I want to inform you that BZB provides training and certification services for Cybersecurity Introduction Foundation and Lead Cybersecurity Manager. A BCB certificate will exemplify your dedication in implementing and managing cybersecurity processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, Nick, please, you may start to read the questions. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a question. Shall we install patches from vendors right away when published? Uh, no. It's best to wait um, at least a few days. If it's for a server, um, we used to wait two weeks just to make sure the latest Windows update got pulled. So just don't be the very first. Um, if you delay your patching to weekends, so if anything comes out on patch Tuesday, if you want to wait to the weekend, um, it's, it's a horrible situation because you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. I've had more downtime from bad patching than anything else. Um, more downtime from failed updates than any form of malware. So it, it's a hard one. You have to look at the risks and make a judgment. So second question, how do we ensure that the backup are not contaminated with viruses? Uh, well, you can check them, you can scan them, just, uh, plug them into a different machine and use a third party scanner and check them. Uh, can you please elaborate why hackers target mostly small businesses? Um, well, small businesses um, tend to work for bigger businesses, and those businesses work for even bigger businesses. We're, we're along the food chain, so we're the, uh, the low-hanging fruit because we all have bigger clients than ourselves. So uh, I need the prereqs in terms of courses to take before. Uh, you have to ask Ardy in that one. Um, that particular question. So just recapping on why hackers target uh, small businesses. They all are targeting big businesses as well. Um, we're all caught in the same net, but if they know who some of our clients are, 
they, they can they can target us because they know we don't have the same defenses. We don't have the teams of people. Um, we we put on our websites, you know, who's in the company. It's not hard to work out who the owner is, who deals with finance, and send emails pretending to be one or the other. Um, and like I say, we all have bigger clients. So for us, if you, you know, you attack us, if you want to try and get to any of the big pension funds, because you know, we send them stuff all the time. And on our construction sites, there'll be big banners and posters that you know, say who we are and who it's for. So we're giving the information away. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll hand you back to Ardy and thank you. Thank you, Nick, again for this great session and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. For more information, you can visit our website www.pcb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.